The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection, I'm Marsha Alvar. Derek Bell is one of this country's leading experts on race, racism and the law. In the 1960s, he worked as a lawyer with Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP to desegregate public schools in the Deep South. He was the first black tenured law professor at Harvard, where he spent more than 20 years before leaving in 1990 to protest the law school's failure to add a tenured black woman to its faculty. Bell is the author of several books on the struggle for racial justice in this country. His newest is Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Marcia. Happy to be here. Why is racism so indestructible? One of the things I think is that we have mischaracterized it. We have misdiagnosed it, if you will. For years and years, we thought that racism was an aberration a defect on the American scene, one that was a holdover from slavery, one that we had the tools to correct through law, and one that there was a desire to correct. Um, and it's taken us a long time to recognize that that was a wrong diagnosis, that uh, racism is an important stabilizing uh, function, serves a, a stabilizing function in a society that is built on property. And in a society where a great many whites don't have any property to speak of, certainly don't have as much as those on the top, what the society has given them from the time of slavery to the present is a sense of property in their whiteness, that their skin color enables them to somehow identify uh, and live vicariously the lives of those on the top as also through the soap operas and the tabloids and the, and the hopes through the uh, lotteries, and to feel superior to blacks who, whatever their status, are deemed on, on the bottom. What you just said is summed up very succinctly in a paragraph that you use uh, to open your book, and it's the paragraph that yes. contains the book's title, and I, I wanted you to read that paragraph yeah. for us. Black people are the magical faces at the bottom of society's well. Even the poorest whites, those who must live their lives only a few levels above, gain their self-esteem by gazing down on us. Surely they must know that their deliverance depends on letting down their ropes. Only by working together is escape possible, and over time, Many do reach out, but most simply watch, mesmerized into maintaining their unspoken commitment to keeping us where we are at whatever cost to them or to us. As you mentioned, the way we viewed slavery has become a kind of mythology. Um, and and <clears throat> Gunnar Murdahl, for example, viewed slavery as, as an aberration in America's history and, and racism as a kind of vestigial tale that yes. would just drop away over time. And, and in the book you talk about the fact that racism is it's cyclical. It's not linear. It's not a steady drop well, away. Well, certainly the progress, what we de de uh, denominate, might as well use a three <laughs> sort of a word, <laughs> what we denominate is progress is cyclical. Most Americans say, well, it's not what it should be, but it's getting better, better all the time. Is that a Beatles song or something <laughs> like that? And, 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 and it seems to be at first glance, but when you look closely, you see that rights are gained in one era and they're lost in the next, only to be gained in another era and lost in, in the next. And I've found a pattern. It seems to me that all black gains from the ending of slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation down to the current controversial affirmative action all have their origins 
in policies that are um, adopted by whites, or at least those whites who have power and are, are policy making, because they are perceived to be a benefit to the nation as, as a whole or to uh, certain aspects of the, of the nation. Now, of course, we all know that giving up racism would be a great benefit for, to, to the nation. But the fact is that the Emancipation Proclamation is a good example. Lincoln told us, told the country, that he was, his main intention was to save the Union. He would do that however he could. If ending slavery would do it, he would do that. If keeping all the blacks in slavery he would do it, he would do that. When he discovered that ending slavery would A, disrupt the Southern workforce, B, uh, cause England and France, that was, they were moving towards supporting the Confederacy, uh, to back away from that support, and C, to enable the enlistment of uh, thousands of former slaves into the Union forces, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Every civil rights, uh, positive civil rights act has that kind of uh, background. The other part of it is that if you look at the Emancipation Proclamation closely, you'll find that it freed not one slave, that it had only application in those areas uh, that the Confederates held. It excluded explicitly those areas there were slaveholding in Virginia that had in, in, in Ohio that had not broken away from, from, the, from the Union. And it's so interesting to look back that far, but the same patterns can be found in modern uh, civil rights laws. But having gone through these cycles, you know, in, in, in our lifetime, the 1960s, okay. and we Brown really decision. are no further ahead for having gone through those cycles. Mm -hmm. Is it really a historic diminishing mm -hmm. over time? I, you know, certainly there's been change and some improvement. But if you look at the conditions in the inner city black community today, um, uh, you can't imagine a time when, you can't imagine that slavery could have been worse. The society and the pressures of the society have, have now uh, made the, the Ku Klux Klan is not the major threat. Black people are the major threat uh, to, their, to, to their own. Maya Angelou talks about uh, the fact that how, how could we have come to this point uh, where uh, the brothers see themselves as, as their own worst enemies. In the book you argue that, that we've come to this point because of a number of mythologies that we continue to hold about race, our attitude towards towards the, slap, uh, the chapter of slavery being one. Another myth that you talk about has to do with our belief that integration is the ultimate goal, using the mm. law as our chief weapon, that integration is the way to racial justice. And we thought that th through contact, through education, through association, and certainly little things happen. But you can't look at the degree of racial hostility today and feel that that was a success. For one thing, a much larger force is the economic condition of the slave. Uh, so you say you, we need more economics and less ethics. I, I think in our society, I'm sad to say, ethics follows <laughs> economics. <laughs> and often enough, they're not very positive uh, ethics. But you can trace the condition of the nation's economy uh, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, there's a number of blacks who were lynched each year. You explore this whole I this dichotomy between economics and ethics in, in a couple of chapters of your book, and, and one of them um, is called the Racial Preference Licensing Act. Right. Can you explain that? Yeah, the, um, the American Bar Association Journal uh, published a cover story and reprinted that, that chapter, and I've been building fortifications outside my apartment. <laughs> where the conservatives on the ABA <laughs> get rid of it. Actually, I was trying to make the point that civil rights statutes today, the ones that we worked so hard for 20 years ago, are all but obsolete. Because they assumed that there was going to be blatant discrimination, signs over the door, get away he from here, don't, we, we don't Whites hire only. you all. Whites only. And, and that's not what we have at all. Uh, we have a situation uh, where I can be served in a restaurant wonderful restaurant, good meal, deferential servants. And when my actor son looks for a waiting job, as actors generally do, he would be turned away because he's black, you see. I don't know whether New, uh, uh, Seattle is better than New York. In New York, you virtually never see a black waiter in a, uh, in a decent restaurant. Now, 
What I was trying to do with the story, and by the way, it provides a new federal law is passed. The other old statutes are set aside. And this new law allows people to segregate or discriminate on the basis of race, but they have to apply to the federal government for a license. Now, the license is expensive, but not prohibitively so. And they must post the license saying that we don't serve blacks or we don't save, serve Asians or we don't hire this group or what have you. Have to post it in a public place. And they also have to, during the period of which the, when it's in effect, uh, give over a small percentage, 2%, 3%, of their uh, net profits to the, in a special tax that goes into an equality fund that is administered by civil rights types to help blacks get education, start businesses, get home loans, and, and what have you. Well, <laughs> that seems, what are we doing? We're going back to uh, separate but equal. But maybe so, maybe no. I'm not sure that I advocate that kind of rule, but the, the discussion of it enables us to see, A, uh, that there's plenty of discrimination now, that we don't get anything back into the Equality Fund, and B, that if you were able to do it, it might take some of the fun out of it. In other words, I think some discrimination is just strictly economic, um, and, and some is a sense of, I don't have to hire them if I don't want to. It's my business. I'm going to do what I want. No one can tell me what to now do. Now you could do what you want, but it's going to cost you. And I think, although I'm not sure, that if you had a statute like this, violators of the statute, those who discriminated without a license, might be subject to far more serious penalties that the society would be willing to impose. Because as it is now, the society, while they, most people don't like discrimination, they certainly don't admit it, have a secret uh, feeling of sympathy for those who are brought up on charges, he should be able to hire whom he wants. He should be able to have in their apartments the people they want. Now, they can do that, but you have to play by the rules. This whole matter of, of economics and ethics is also uh, dealt with in, in the chapter called Space Traders, where a group yeah. of, of outer space creatures come to the United States and make an offer. That's right. I want, I, I, many of my stories start off as lessons for my class, and then they build and what have you. And one of the lessons is this idea, it's the other part of what we were talking about earlier. That is, if there is an opportunity to sacrifice black, if there's an opportunity for moving the society ahead that requires the sacrifice of black rights, they get sacrificed. And, and sort of an ultimate example of that would be a group coming from outer space that offered the United States, they came in these huge ships in the year 2000, and they offered the United States gold to pay off by then the bankrupt federal, state, and, and local governments, uh, chemicals to clean up the by then uh, pretty messed up environment, and a safe nuclear engine and fuel to uh, replace the by then um, depleted um, uh, fossil fuel sources. And they want only one thing. They want to take back to their home star all African Americans. Well, in the story, there's a, they give us 16 days, and there's great debates, and different groups take different uh, positions. And finally, there's a constitutional amendment and a national referendum, which is not how our constitutional amendments, but we have a little literary license here. <laughs> And the, uh, the vote is uh, 70 to 30 to take the trade. Now, as all of these segments of society are debating, and it's fascinating because the, the politicians are, they're, they're for going with the space traders. Uh, private enterprise is not. They think it's yeah. a financial disaster and they want to throw everything they have against this deal. Uh, the televangelists are all for it. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of this debate, a man named Gleason Golightly who is looked on with great skepticism in the black community, makes a remarkable proposal. Yeah, Gleason represents those black Republicans or black conservative academics uh, who always feel that they are really qualified and they can do it from the inside and they can do more good. And Gleason, in fact, does do a lot of good quietly, and but he is certainly scorned by much of He's the seen black as a community. Token. Seen as a token and a handkerchief head, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> Well, when they have the cabinet meeting, he's not a member of the cabinet, but he's brought in. And many of the cabinet officers that support the trade, 
And he's asked to give his view. And he said, I've gone along with you on many things. I've supported you even at the cost of my reputation in the black community. But this is going too far. I don't think you should do it. Well, of course, they, they kind of ignore him. And he then tries to go before the civil rights groups, the people who have ostracized him, and prob properly so, and said, and they're busy getting ready to file lawsuits, all, all the regular civil rights stuff. And he said, you know, forget it. None of that is going to work. The, you have to use your heads with white folk, otherwise you're, you're lost. And he said, the only thing that will convince them not to accept the trade is if they think we are going to be taken off to the land of milk and honey. That we're going to get a better deal We're going to get a better have. deal than they have. And then just to fight us, they'll vote <laughs> against it, you see. It's a very subversive but proposal. The, but the very uh, uh, high-minded individuals, the civil rights leaders, they are appalled. They would rather go off to God knows what fate than to lie and scheme about this kind of thing. But and sadly, said, that's exactly yeah, what happens. And that's exactly what happens. And lightly is, everyone says, oh, you're talking about Tom Soul or you're talking about Glenn Lowry. But as a matter of fact, I may have started that way, but I was talking about myself. Mm. You see, it's not simply the conserve the Clarence Thomases who serve this uh, the white society, who comfort them, uh, as uh, Clarence does and some of the others, Justice Thomas does and some of the others, by saying it's not racist and those blacks just can't get themselves together. It's also those of us who have worked our behinds off over the years to achieve a modicum of economic success and academic success and what have you. Because much of white society can look at us and say, Bell made it, he's black, he must have faced discrimination. Why can't the rest of them do like you? You could end up using, you used as a club in yeah. a sense. So that the difference between myself and a Clarence Thomas in terms of our ability to serve or, our, or our, uh, the results of our serving the society's um, need uh, for comforting with regard to their role with you know, in, in racial situations is, is, is far less broad than I would think. You touched on, on, on another myth earlier in our conversation, that a kind of formula in a sense that education mm -hmm. leads to enlightenment, which then yes. leads to, to empathy. And your response to that in the book is, is, we need less idealism and we need more realism. In a sense, what we need is not to even hope or believe that we can win, but we have to believe in the constancy of the struggle. Yeah. I think that there is, I look at our slave forebears and wonder how did they do it year after year, decade after decade, generation. When they first came, they might have hoped that there was going to be some liberation, some revolution. But year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. And we know though from the spirituals and the other artifacts that they were able to get beyond, that they had a life it was not totally so circumscribed by the horrors of slavery, that somehow they were able to retain their humanity and give it to us as a, as a, uh, a legacy, really. Well, if they could do that in those circumstances, then we can both face up to the permanency of racism and find that conclusion not depressing but enlightening, find it a basis for renewed determination that we are going to continue uh, to fight. You speak a, about this in, in very determined terms in this book. And it, I was thinking as I read it about a piece that Cornell West at, at Princeton wrote mm -hmm. not long ago, a piece called Learning to Talk of Race. And, and in that piece, he talked about the need for hope, the need for leadership, as yeah. he said, to recognize that we are all part of a single garment of destiny. No, and, I, I, and I couldn't find yeah. in your book that well, same passion I, for leadership. I think, I'm fo focused more on the individuals. I think if individuals function, leaders come forth. That's Martin Luther King, isn't it? The people determined that they'd had enough. And they looked around and they recruited uh, King to serve as their leader, as their spokes, spokesperson. I think that hope must come out of truth to hope that we're going to have an integrated society in the way that we have for so many years is not any longer 
a source of real hope. Rather, we must look and find out what the real problem is and around that base strategies on which we can reconstitute a hope and, 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 and determination. What we need in life really more than wealth, although that's subversive in this society, uh, more than success is, 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 is meaning. We want our lives to have meaning. We go chasing off all over, over these things. Our lives can have meaning whether racism ends or, or, or not. And the meaning comes from commitment, a humble commitment toward recognizing evil and trying to do something about it. Often enough, even if I know that racism will never end, the struggle toward trying to make it end enables miracles to happen that I hadn't expected and which in themselves are worthwhile. The, the departure from Harvard was, was well publicized when you took an unpaid leave yeah. of absence, but, but it's not the first time that you've done a, an act yeah. like that, that some might consider somewhat unorthodox uh, and, and possibly detrimental to a career. Yeah. At the University of Oregon, you resigned as dean because an Asian American woman who emerged as the leading candidate for a hire, you were directed not to hire her. And your very first job with the Justice Department, you ended up quitting because they insisted you quit the NAACP saying it was a conflict of interest. Where, where did that come from? Where did you, in, in your history, in your life, decide that those moments would be so important to you that you would do mm -hmm. what, what many other people just consider to be unthinkable? Yeah. And I'm still, uh, my next book, is going to be on confronting authority. And the first talent challenge is to answer that question <laughs> and then see whether there's anything in the answer that will be of help to other, to other people. Well, I think, though, that there are a number of things. I think that when, when people do you wrong, if I can use this expression, the worst harm is to your insides, that you churn and, and you just can't get rid of it. Once you confront them and say that is wrong, you may lose your job but your insides feel fine. The other thing is that, um, I like to quote my good friend Alice Walker, who, before she was Alice Walker, had an opportunity to write a magazine uh, story, and the editors said they wanted to make all kinds of changes she didn't want to make, and she, they told her, if you want us to publish this finally, you have to make these changes. And she gathered up all of her stuff and said, all I have to do is save my soul. And I really believe that when I look back on my challenges and my quitting jobs, I got to tell you, Marcia, some of them were not so wise. Uh, some of it was counterproductive, as perhaps the thing with Harvard was. I, I, I hate leaving uh, the job that I worked so hard to get. But I'm never sorry because I did something I didn't back down you see. And that provides both a basis for feeling good about yourself, which for black men in this society is not easy to come by. And if I ever have to um, uh, respond to someone who asks, what did you do with your life? I, I, I think I have something that I can tell them. Your, your parents were heroes in this regard. They yes, really yes. set an example for you. I, I always talk about my mother taking my brother and I to the rent office during the Depression and waving the rent at the man and telling him she had it and he would get it when he fixed the back stairs. And wondering what could have happened. We could have all been out of there. And in fact, they fixed our stairs and fixed everybody else's. But I don't talk as much about my father, who had only a sixth grade education, who was a, when he got a good job, he was a janitor. And then when he developed narcolepsy and had to move outside, started a tr tr uh, rubbish hauling business. And I remember his dealings with white men on the loading docks and all. They called him by his first name, but they didn't play around with him, hitting on the arm as he did some of my father's uh, workers. He erected a sort of invisible shield that no one said anything, but everyone knew these men could not go beyond that. And I always thought that was an amazing thing. I, I recognized it as a child, um, but I, 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 I appreciated as, as an adult what he was able to do. One of the uh, parts of our society that I found missing in the book, I was curious mm. about it, was the media. 
because the images that we have of each other have become so powerful, lacking mm. a lot of daily interplay and real integration. I was struck, I read about uh, a young man in Dubuque, Iowa, during racial turmoil taking place in that community. He was asked about black people, and he said, well, I don't know any, he said, but they're always the bad guys on television. Yeah. And you keep finding that, that more and more, and yet they... They don't show yeah. up in this book. I think I did a little bit more in the first uh, first book, but you're right that that could be almost a uh, book in of itself. I just came, if I have a minute more, uh, from times flying so fast. Yeah, <laughs> I just came down from um, Vancouver, where the Washington State Bar was meeting, and I spoke, uh, and there was a panel response about recruiting minorities uh, into the law, and everybody thinks that's a good idea. But I raised the question. And uh, the title of the talk was Living with the Specter of Calhoun. And I went back, Calhoun was the kind of shyster lawyer on the old Amos and Andy series. And he was everything that we upstanding lawyers feel that we are, we are not, we young black lawyers. And yet I was trying to put in, in what the media had done in creating and perpetuating uh, that stereotype. It's just really very hard. The fact is that an awful lot of the sitcoms today uh, starring blacks are sort of upgraded versions of Amos and Andy, and, that, and, that, and that's a shame. Mm -hmm. And black people don't much complain today as they didn't complain about Amos and Andy uh, because black people were at least getting jobs, you see. But I, I, I wondered about that, that, that stereotype that is perpetuated by the media and wondered how different are those of us who are so committed to civil rights and who have not recognized what I've been trying to recognize in this book about the difficulty. Because we have really led people astray un unintentionally as uh, good old Calhoun did intentionally. So that the society has distorted the roles and made the, the shyster and the committed lawyer much closer together in terms of result than one would ever imagine. Well, images, this is the mm -hmm. subject for a whole other book, and I hope you write that book very soon and come back and visit us again. Thank you, Marcia. Derek Bell, thank you for being a guest on Upon Reflection. Your new book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. Thanks again. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.